Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the Middleton Chambers on track session for June. We get to talk about performance reviews today. Yay. Um, for those of you that I haven't met, my name is Kristen Parent, and I am happy to be hosting this on behalf of the chamber. So as we get started, um, I want to shout out to our sponsor, Upper Iowa University. We certainly appreciate their partnership in helping make these programs accessible to our members. So uh, as we go through um, just a reminder, some of us have done a lot of Zooms in the last few years, but maybe not so many lately. That little red slash through your microphone means you're on mute. We are going to ask you to stay on mute for most of the presentation. We will have some Q&A towards the end. Um, and also, Lisa's going to talk a little bit about how she wants to utilize chat as we go along. So we do want it to be interactive. And then if you're able or can, we would love to see those beautiful smiling faces. So uh, feel free to turn your camera on as well. Um, <clears throat> and then I am recording the session today and we'll get a copy of the slides. So following today's presentation, I'll send out a follow-up email that will get all of that material to you guys as well. So you can review it again or share it with other team members. So with that, I would love to introduce Lisa Hershert. She specializes in the design and implementation of performance management system. She coaches managers on how to bring out the best in employees and works with employers to position their people to do work that provides the greatest level of purpose and meaning. So Lisa, I'd love to turn it over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Kristen. So, and thank you everybody for joining me today. Um, I'd like, I'd, I just wanna start out by saying that I, I'd really like the session to be as informal and conversational as possible, as it can be via Zoom. So if you have any questions as we go through the material, um, I want you to ask them in the moment by just typing in, in the chat. I did get the chat working, Kristen. I did find it on my screen. Um, and I'll leave spaces at the end too, but we'll get the most out of our hour together if you can interact with the presentation. So feel free. and. If you want to take yourself off mute and talk, that's fine too, but um, it's easy in the chat as well. And then I'll, I can see it and then I'll respond right there. So hopefully you can do that. So um, today's agenda, it, what we're planning is we're going to learn about the best practices for a performance management system that takes a strategic approach to achieving business goals through your people. We'll explore how changing annual performance reviews into ongoing performance conversations simplifies the process and how aligning employee goals with the business strategy drives engagement. And finally, why building trust is the foundation for productive feedback. I'm also going to leave you with some tools and templates to help you use what you've learned today when you get back, back to work. So, why do we do performance management? Tell me in the chat, what, what, what's your impressions? Do, if you do it at all, if you don't do it, say that too. But if you do it, what, what do you think the reasons why we do it? Anybody? HR makes me, that's a pretty common question. <laughs> yeah, because we have to, yeah. Um, to confirm leaders and staff are on the page, same page. Yeah, that's true. Yes, it's a good reason right there. Um, really, the purpose is to bring together the, the various factors contributing to job performance, understanding and executing the job description. Oh, we have another hit company goals. However, we go from high focus to no focus on review. Okay. Um, do provide positive and critical comments to recognize good performance and improve poor performance. Good. Those are great, great comments. Um, so yeah, we want to understand the job description, set and achieve employee goals um, as it relates to the position, develop uh, personal and interpersonal skills, and um, all of those things. But uh, it's not really meeting those goals, um, unfortunately. So a little bit of research here, uh, according to the Corporate Leadership Council, 90% of managers think the process is ineffective and doesn't deliver business results. Does that sound right? Everybody agree? <laughs> yeah. Um, according to Gallup, 86 employees say that the performance reviews don't inspire them to improve their performance. And that's the whole point of that, isn't it? 
And according to Sherm, everybody know what Sherm is? So it's kind of like the guy, you know, it's, you know, it's Society of Human Resources Management. So Sherm, if Sherm is, HR managers are saying that 75% of them would not, would give their own process a grade of C or lower. So that's pretty bad. <laughs> Um, so the reason why we see this data is because traditional performance management processes don't match the change and pace of business today, and they don't provide employees with what they want and what they need from their employers. So there's a lot on this little chart here, um, but basically, you know, what it's telling us is the, you know, the four generations that are in the, in the workforce today, 40% of them are millennials. They're holding steady from three years ago. So this looks at three years ago in 2020 and today, as far as the percentage of these four different generations in the workforce. So millennials, 40%, still pretty high. Gen X is declining. That's 36% of the workforce in 2020, and now they're 33%. Boomers, they're really declining. They went from 19% three years ago to 7% today. And Gen Z is grown. They've grown really fast in the last three years. So we went from 6% to 20% of the workforce. So what does that all mean? So basically, you have to think about this, these new generations and, and, and knowing, knowing about knowing about what they're looking for and how they're different is really important. So Today, millennials and Gen Z make up 60% of the workforce. That percentage will only continue to grow. And studies show that Gen Z and millennials want continuous feedback. Much like they receive from their helicopter parents, I raised my hand there, um, they want their managers to care about them, to coach them, to nurture them, to guide them in career and life. They're primed for feedback conversations. They want to contribute. They want jobs with purpose and they want their manager to tell them how they can be great. My daughter's a millennial and she's only been out of college and in the workforce for two years. Um, but when we talked about her job, what she told me she wanted most and what was lacking the most was regular feedback and direction, a path to the future. So um, while employees, people my age tend to look at feedback as negative, probably because <laughs> You know that was that you know that's the traditional approach, right? Just tell no news is good news and and let me know when I'm doing something bad, but once a year. Um, she sees feedback as helpful, and she didn't receive enough of it, and that was one of the reasons she decided to change jobs. So, but all people, regardless of generation, want meaningful work and personal growth from their jobs. Um, so that we know is true. That's universal, but it's the millennials and the Gen Zs that are asking for it and looking elsewhere when they don't receive it. So I have a question here. What is considered regular feedback? Does a short conversation qualify or does it have to be in a meeting environment? That's a great question. Um, it, you know, okay, let's just say, you know, I, I give a presentation. And you, you know, telling me how I did or telling me, hey, Lisa, you could have spoken louder or slower, or maybe you should have done, you know, done this or that. That's, be, that's it, it can be a short conversation, I guess, in answer to your question. Yes, absolutely. Feedback is anything. Anytime you're telling someone how they did or maybe correcting something, that's feedback. And it can, it can be very brief. Um, and should be. It doesn't have to be a formal sit down, um, which can be really <laughs> kind of scary and intimidating, actually. So um, anyway, so great question. Thank you. And keep them coming. So in order for us to talk about best practices, we first need to look at what's not working. So everybody, too, I, I can't see everybody, but if you could, you know, maybe in the in the chat or something, let me know, you know, are you doing performance reviews now? Are you where you're working, do they do them? Do you, would you say it's the traditional approach where you're sitting down once a year with your manager, even maybe twice a year? Um, my husband, they just moved it to, to um, every quarter. <laughs> and um, so is that kind of the thing? So I've got Ashley here, we do 
annual reviews, Kristen, we do traditional annual review. Okay. All right. Well, good. Um, I mean, not good, but one time per year, um, we have been doing formal reviews once a year and currently transitioning to a coaching model. Okay. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, and then Brian, annual, but looking to move to more regular coaching conversations. I love to hear that. So, um, that's great. And you can take this information back and, and say, Hey, here's, here's why we're doing this. Right. So, um, in the traditional approach, you're sitting down once a year. Um, and it's a lot of work, right? Um, managers are often trying to collect a year's worth of information last minute, you know, they, and, and that's why it's so much work. And that's why they spend more time putting together the performance review than actually talking to the person because, they're trying to dig all that up from a whole year. Um, and they didn't have a good system maybe to, to collect it all. And you, we all have the best intentions, right? Um, and if for the employee though, it's really intimidating to walk in and know that your, your, all of your work for the past year is about to be examined. So it's really too much pressure for everybody involved. So in the traditional approach, infrequent feedback leads to what we call the recency effect. We remember what happened the most clear recently, the most clearly, and we forget important details if it happened several months or even a year ago. In annual reviews, uh, managers they struggle to recall what happened throughout the year, and they tend to rely on most recent events. And then, if performance demands increase or goals change throughout the year, then really important facts are missed. When evaluations can't actually capture the changing demands faced by employees, they aren't an accurate reflection of the employee's performance. So if you think about like getting feedback, it's most valuable when people receive it in the moment, right? Because they remember the details of what, what happened, what they're getting the feedback about, and they can use the feedback to, to correct their course and learn and grow. And you know, next time I do this, I'll, I can do it differently. Um, and hearing that I did something wrong or that I need to improve a behavior months later really feels just like a criticism. It doesn't feel like good feedback. Um, it needs to be timely for it to be helpful and feel constructive. And employee feedback is situationally relevant and development focused, leaving the employee more likely to have positive feelings about the interaction and about the manager. So traditional approach. We set our goals in January and revisit them a year later. Is that is that kind of sound accurate? Is that what we're doing? Um, and we have the best intentions, but really how often do our priorities change during the year? Do they change or do they not change? <laughs> do they just stay the same? No. Um, and if the goals are changing for the business and not employees, those employees don't feel connected to the business and what the business is trying to achieve. Um, the traditional approach um, sets goals for the employee based on improvements that need to be made to the performance, but they've forgotten about until the following year. Have you ever done that where you, and, and because I used to manage when I worked for in the corporate world and I managed the process and I read every review, you know, managers would write all these goals and they'd have it all planned out. And then they literally would not look at it again until the year later. <laughs> so, um, what, you know, what good is that? You know, what, so it's no wonder that everybody thinks it's, it's an exercise in futility because it really is. And you're just, it, because they're doing it because they have to, you know, because HR is making us do it. Um, and really you want it to work for you. You want it to, it's supposed to be a tool and that's what you want to make it. So Today's workforce wants a job that feels meaningful. We know that, right? So for their job to feel meaningful, they need to understand the company's strategy so that they can see how their role contributes to the success of the organization. Employees need to understand the strategy and the value so that they can see a connection between their performance and the company's success. The traditional approach have managers cascading goals, but their if there, there can be a misalignment if the performance targets are constantly changing and expectations aren't clear. So raise your hand if you're average or tell me in the chat. Are you average, everybody? 
No, we're all above average, right? But traditional performance evaluations rely heavily on performance ratings to label per employee performance, compare employees to their peers, and make decisions about merit pay and promotions. And there's several problems with this approach. Um, number one, unconscious and conscious bias can impact how a manager views an employee's performance. Every manager has a different way of looking at the ratings and defining them or perceiving them. Um, on a scale of one to five, managers who are conflict averse are gonna rate everybody a five. Um, some managers think that never giving a five is going to motivate that employee to want to do better. Well, that has the opposite effect. Um, managers who struggle with decisions, they might rate everyone a three. So what some companies are doing is they're getting rid of five ratings. They're saying it's either it's four, so you can't pick in the middle. Um, my husband's company, which happens to be the federal government, um, they just went to pass fail which he he likes a lot better because he's not having to, to I mean, it's a painful process for everybody, right? But I, I don't even, I think that's kind of dumb because fail if you're failing, you shouldn't find that out in your performance review. You got to be talking about that ahead of time. So um, they're getting there though. But um, really ratings were invented to create standardization across the business, but it's really it's not standardized if you look at it. If you look, if you, you know, if you consider the fact that every manager is different the way they view it. There's the recency effect that we talked about earlier. And ratings are one directional. So nobody is invited to rate their manager, you know, unless it's a 360. So um the biggest problem with ratings is that they, they're they demotivate people. Um, and if you've ever been rated average or meets expectations, which is this your manager's opinion, by the way, um, you know what I mean. Also, if if your ratings are or your your entire year is reduced to a single number, that really feels awful. And especially if you feel that that rating is inaccurate, and then it's going to determine what you're going to get paid or whether or not you're going to get promoted. So. If you kind of, if you think it, think about it that way, it really, um, it, it's just, their, their ratings just aren't good. But I, I know a lot of, a lot of companies use them. So there's a way to use them in a little better way. Um, but anyway, the, I guess the bottom line is you don't want a good employee to leave because of a bad process. So managers aren't the bad guy here. They want to do better, but most of the time they're not trained on how to coach, how to develop, how to set goals, how to give feedback, or any of the other leadership um, skills that managers who want to get the best out of their people need to learn. And that I think that's pretty universal across most companies when, when they talk about this is what we need the most is our managers to be trained. It's true. Um, if you want to make an investment in your people, training your managers how to lead is one of the best ones you can make. It's it's got the it'll have the biggest impact. Okay, so now on to best practices. So um, you can manage performance, motivate people, develop capabilities, improve retention and engagement by having continual performance discussions. Um, okay, I have a question here. I wonder if I should interrupt myself. I'm going to go ahead. Ashley said, recommending recommendations for asking for feedback on management from an employee. Context, it's only one employee, so I'm finding it difficult to provide them with a space where they feel comfortable to give me honest feedback. Oh, that's a great question. And let's come back to that, Rachel, or Ashley, sorry. Let's come back to that because I think I have the answer for you. Um, that is great. And I'll just start out by saying when, when I start, when I first... In my last job in the corporate world, I took a job. I was an HR director. And one of the first things I told people was, I want you to give me feedback. And I tried to build trust. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that. It's hard for them. But I think encouraging them to do it is is one of the things you can do. So um, anyway, Continual performance discussions, not necessarily evaluate, even the, the word that you use, evaluations or 
reviews sounds a little negative, but if you say we're going to have performance discussions or check-ins, um, you do it throughout the year. This is what management is. And you're probably already doing it if you're talking to your people on a regular basis. So you just need to get into the habit of documenting important discussions and coaching conversations as you go. Doesn't mean you're going to write everything down, but when you give somebody feedback, you just make a note if you, and, and you have a, you have a place to make that note. Um, you coach somebody, you make a note or you, you put it in email. Um, you just keep track of it. New performance management technology. Um, some is standalone and others integrate with your HR system and payroll system. They provide, they usually, the, they provide tools like journaling platforms. Does anybody use any of those? Anybody familiar with that? Um, all kinds of tools you can use and it's everything's online. There's no paper. Um, and they provide this journal where you and your employee both can make quick notes throughout the year, track goals, measure performance on an ongoing basis. If you don't have a budget for this, you can create journals in a program like OneNote. Um, I used to do that. I do actually, I, I use that a lot. I like that because you can share it with each other and you don't have to send it back and forth. You know, it's just automatically, like it's updates live all the time. Um, and what happens when you take this approach is that your conversations become more deliberate. You're able to hold employees accountable and you'll find you're celebrating success more often. Um, and remember too, you don't have to be the only one giving feedback. Gen Z, who doesn't have much of an appreciation for the hierarchy of business, really wants feedback from everybody. So you can request feedback from an employee's peers. Um, somebody works on a project with you know, from another manager, anyone that works with that person. And you can use the performance software to do that, or you can use just use simple email. Um, but that's something that you can add to that file and use it, you know, and this is this is part of their overall picture of their performance. If you still want to have a summary review of progress at the end of the year, it's taking a little longer maybe to get away from that annual review or that annual. I'd like to call it a summary review then. Um, all the information is right at your fingertips if you've documented it throughout the year and you don't have to rack your brain to remember what happened. And then because employees have already heard the feedback, there's no surprises, which to me, that's the best benefit because there's nothing worse than walking in and having no idea and then finding out that, you know, somebody was holding something against you for the last six months or three months or whatever it might be. And believe and managers do that. They use, you know, managers that I've worked with have, have done that. Um, so um, understand what's working and what's not with your people, get their opinions, ask for their feedback on how they're doing, what they need from you. So that's something actually that you can ask, you know, what do you need from me to be successful? Um, Talk with them about their development and their career aspirations. You know, you talk about them. People love to talk about themselves. Let them know that that's your job. You're there to support their success. And by doing that, you'll have more dedicated and, and get engaged people. Um, it's totally guaranteed. Um, I, I have lots of stories of that working and people... They they're so... I've seen people get really, really loyal to a manager where they... And, I used to work with the sales team and they were they were always getting recruited but away by our customers who would offer more money, less travel. But I had this one team who would tell me, I'm I will never leave David, <laughs> no matter what, because he coaches me, he listens to me, he cares about me, and it, it really works. So um that's and you, you've probably heard that that saying too, that people don't leave companies, they leave managers. That's so true. It's really true. So a best practice is to think of mistakes. Well, everyone makes mistakes, right? And that's the best way to learn often, right? It That's how I learned the best. Um, it's important to coach employees on the difference between carelessness and negligence and an honest mistake, of course. Um, but some progressive leaders don't call these types of mistakes or failures mistakes, but they call them learnings. Um, so one way that you can do this and encourage this on your team is to owning your own mistakes 
and admitting when you're wrong and talking about what you learned from it. Um, that will that will really encourage your employees to do that. And um, it creates a, a culture of accountability. I try to be as authentic as I can and real um, and it works. And, 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 and I, I like it. I think, you know, if you like, what, what's the most powerful, you probably have been asked the question, what's the most powerful two words? Well, it's not, thank you. It's I'm wrong or I'm sorry. Well, that's actually four words, but two words. And they have a lot of meaning. I was wrong about that. And I'm sorry I did that are really more powerful than thank you, believe it or not. So employees who have goals aligned with the business objectives can really clearly see their value and contributions to the organization. And that makes them really engaged in what's going on and engaged in the business. So goal setting should be collaborative. And if it is, people are more motivated to reach their goals when they have a voice in creating them. Collaborating with their manager gives them a hand in defining success. And they really feel a stronger sense of accomplishment when, when they're bought into what they're doing. Um, and this can be individual goals and team goals. And really for performance reviews to serve their ultimate purpose in helping people grow and improve, the conversation really has to improve um, include progress towards development goals. And managers have to be responsible for helping employees identify and meet those goals. And that really influences employee engagement as well. Smart goals. They're, uh, they're smart for a reason. Um, and if you make all your, you make sure that you make all your goals and your employees' goals smart, um, and specific, they can be measured, they're achievable, they're relevant, um, and they're time bound with milestones and deadlines. The likelihood of success is exponentially, ex exponentially greater. Um, I tried to put it, I, I created a guide and, and put that in place, um, at my last company. And I mean, and, and it was new, you know, and, and people, you know, the goal would be something like learn Excel. <laughs> you know, and and that's not a smart goal. You know, you need to think there's a lot of missing pieces there. So I'm mean, one of the tools I'm going to provide you is a is a um, a worksheet for for making smart goals that you can take take away and use. So instead of subject subjective ratings, you can measure performance with quantitative and qualitative metrics that reflect key outcomes and are within the employee's control. Examples include progress on goals. Behaviors aligned to the company's values, productivity, profitability, accuracy, efficiency. There's a lot of different metrics that you can that you can use that are they feel they you know they just feel more fact based than a subjective. You're gonna you know your average. Um, and another good practice is to separate discussions about pay and promotions from progress reviews, so that the focus of a review stays on performance accountability and employees development. Otherwise, um, you know, you're talking about a number and that they stop listening after that, you know? So you want, you want it to be, you know, you want somebody to be able to say, Hey, I need to improve. And they're not going to be willing to do that if, if they know that it's so linked. Um, so there's ways to do that too. So this may come as a surprise, but no one is born a leader. And um, all too often, people are promoted into management positions because they're really good at their jobs. Has anybody seen that happen? I've seen it happen so many. It, it's like one of the biggest problems in companies. Um, and, and the skills needed to be really great at your job and to, or, and to be a great manager are very different. Um, so managers who receive training and coaching, giving feedback, motivating employees, having difficult conversations, setting goals, and other leadership traits can they they'll have the tools necessary for getting the best out of their people. If you um, if you provide training, if you train yourself, there's there's so much out there you can get for free. There's things you can read. There's books. Um, 
and becoming a, a great manager is really the best thing you can do for yourself and, and your business, definitely. So here's a question for everybody. And this is a phrase that we hear a lot, right? And what does it mean? What is employee engagement? Anybody have, have, a, have an answer for that in the chat, maybe? Good, we know that, right? <laughs> so really, my I guess my favorite definition of employee engagement is I don't think I got any any chats, um, but it's the willingness to put in discretionary time. So somebody is so dedicated to what you do, and they feel so good that they're willing to put in the, just go that extra mile, right? And not be um, expecting to get paid for it all the time. Not that I mean, not that you should be you know making people work without pay. That's not what I'm saying, but. I, when I think about myself and my willingness to just put in put in extra is that you know that's in, I'm engaged. So do you know who your engaged employees are? If you think about that, if, um, if you think of it about it that way, which you know which ones care about your organization, which ones are dedicated to helping it be successful. Um, Here are six other key characteristics, well, it's not other, but six characteristics of engaged employees according to the great places to work, great places to work. So engaged employees are emotionally committed. They like the company. They generally want the best for it. They see its success as aligned with their success. They are, they have an excellent attitude. They have positive can-do approach to everything. They don't gripe and complain. I mean, every all of us do gripe and complain sometimes, but usually they're just like, yeah, yeah, you know, this is just what we do and not everything's great. And um, okay, I have a chat from Vicki. This is what's nice about the team I work with. Majority are engaged in not only the team coworkers, but the clients. Yes, absolutely. And that's everything, right? If your customers are happy, you're you're gonna be successful. That's a great, that's really great insight. Um, engaged employees go the extra mile. They do what's needed to get the job done. They're not watching the clock so they can be ready to bolt out the door at 5 p.m. Um, yeah, I, <laughs> there was always this one guy in IT who literally like 4.30 on, I don't know if he had an alarm clock or what he was doing, but he walked past my office every single day at exactly 4.30. <laughs> And and he was a an exempt employee, and it just always amazed me. But he was he was not engaged. He really wasn't. Um, and not that you know, we all have. Sometimes people have to leave and get go pick up the kids, or they you know that's. Um, but he didn't have any kids, so I knew why he was leaving. <laughs> um, so engaged employees are collaborative. Um, it, as might be expected, but they're great team players. They get along well with others. And as a manager, you really don't have to worry about team dynamics um, because it's not, I mean, if, and there may be, if, even if there are issues with the team, it's usually not the engaged employee that's causing the problems in that case. Engaged employees are responsible and reliable. They do what they say they'll do. They don't need to be reminded three times. Um, diligence is part of the fabric of how they work. And um, for this reason, depending on other things like interpersonal skills, they can be great potential for management someday too. So that that's something definitely when you're thinking about that next manager, they could be the best salesperson, but if they're not engaged or if they have some other qualities that really don't, um, wouldn't make them good people leaders then think twice about promoting them. So, um, and then the last one is that they're easy to work with. So is, is everybody familiar with the 80-20 rule? In business, yeah. So 80% of business comes from 20% of your customers. So that's really the applicable for employee engagement too, or employee management. 80% of your time is spent with 20% 
of your employees who are more challenging to deal with. Um, in engaged employees not only do a great job, but they're also really low maintenance. <laughs> um, so I got a, ch a chat from Ashley. Do you find that these characteristics are different between generations in terms of committing discretionary time and going the extra mile? Just thinking of the of the act act your wage movement. Yeah, um, you know that's a great question. I don't and I don't know the answer. I I because I'm not an expert on the generations, um, but I think it's a really interesting question. Um, I do know <laughs> that, um, you know, and, and, and when you think about discretionary time, I guess you don't want to think about, okay, I'm willing to work all weekend and, and, and not get paid for it. That's not what I'm talking about. It's, it's more about they, they'll just do a little extra. They're not watching that clock. They're not, ex you know, running out the door at 430. They're, um, they're just there you know and i but you know at the other on the other hand and i'm kind of curious now and i'll have to look into this because my daughter who um that i mentioned earlier she's um she's a, a she works for a news station she's a producer and she's really lucky to be her eight you know to only be two years out of college and have this job that she really wanted um but she has to work mornings. So the morning show, you have to get up like at one in the morning and be there and be ready to run this show. And she's been complaining to me about <laughs> having to do that. So, so yeah, that I think that um, that's something I'm wondering about. Um, they, I know that they value their person. They do value just like you know Generation X kind of. They really value their the work-life balance, that's where the work-life balance started, you know, that discussion, because boomers, you know, they just, they believed in, you know, paying your dues and putting in your time, and they didn't really question it, and they really sacrificed a lot more, I think, especially men. Well, no, that's not true, not especially men. Um, what I mean is that, men, well, men did, they sacrificed their family lives, right, and they were willing to do it, um, and, and women too, you know, and, and I, kids today, kids today, I say it, um, but the younger generations definitely, I think are not willing to do that. So, which maybe that's not such a bad thing, right? Cause it makes, makes us, forces us all to change the way we do things. So um, Gallup conducted a study on the results of employee engagement with an analysis of over 82 thousand business units and found that teams scoring in the top quartile of engagement tend to outperform teams scoring in the bottom quartile by these eye-opening percentages. I won't read through each one of them, but you kind of get the point that there, there's some data out there that really shows um, that, you know, engagement matters and why it matters and how it can really help your company be more successful. So, um, Ashley, this is what I was asking you to hold on for. So, um, really, there's there's one more thing, and this is one of my favorite topics, actually. Um, one more thing that impacts employee engagement and helps you to get the best out of your people, and that is trust. And I talked a little bit about that earlier, but um, you know, that's how you're going to get your pe people to give you feedback is to um, build that trust with them and let them know that you give me feedback, you know, maybe start small, you know, give me feedback on this. And when you don't like react negatively, um, then they're going to learn that, yeah, yeah, that works. I can do that. Um, and then maybe something bigger you ask for their feedback on. But if you think about it, take a moment to really think about a person that you trust. Um, you know, why do you trust them? And um, everybody think of somebody. <laughs> so now think about somebody that you don't trust. We all have them, right? We've all got somebody we don't trust. <laughs> and which one would you want giving you feedback? And, and this is really sad, but I, I have worked for managers who I didn't trust. 
but they were giving me feedback and it was hard um, because I, you know, you wonder if they have your best interests or they really care about you. And, um, if, and it, so that's why it's so important. Um, so what is trust? What's the, you know, how do we define it really? Anybody know, anybody have any thoughts on that? Like what, how you would explain what trust is to someone? Um, it's it's really the willingness to be vulnerable. So when we, re we receive feedback from someone, we're in a vulnerable position. Our job as managers is to provide a safe space where employees can be vulnerable so that they can improve and grow. And we want someone to take feedback without being defensive. And we want them to benefit from that feedback. So trust is really the foundation for everything in business, I think, anyway. That's my opinion. So... Um, has anybody ever heard of the emotional bank account? Yep. So I think this is really a great, um, kind of a great analogy for building trust. You know, everybody has an emotional bank account and it works the same way for an employee as it does for your husband or your friends, um, or your, your wife or your spouse or any, anybody, um, and just like a regular bank account, you make more deposits than you do withdrawals in order to maintain a balance, a, a positive balance. And the more deposits you make, then the easier it's going to be to make a withdrawal, right? And that withdrawal might be, you know, some corrective feedback sometime or, you know, sharing something that could maybe be negative or hurt somebody's feelings. But, um, it, you know, you... you over overwhelmingly weighs with the positive, then it's going to be a lot easier. So um, some other ideas really are right here. Care about people that you work with, learn who they are outside work, remember the name, their families' names um, in important events in their lives, ask for their ideas, their opinions, um, find opportunities to let them shine, um, support them, have their backs, Pay attention to what's going on. Don't make promises. That's kind of honest. Don't make promises you can't keep. Do what you say you're going to do. Um, be honest. Be authentic. Um, admit mistakes. And trust them. Let them be. Let yourself be vulnerable with them. That's kind of really the biggest. Um, I was just working with an organization, and that there was something they were really trying to to do because. And it was part of their DEI initiative. And that was because they wanted everybody to have a voice. And, and we did a lot of, we did a lot of learning about how, you know, different people can, can come in meeting. I mean, there's a, there's a whole thought process about, you know, get creating inclusive meetings so that people feel comfortable speaking up and don't just hold back their ideas because that impacts diversity too, right? And you don't hear diverse ideas if people are, afraid of speaking up and I was working with the CEO and and she was trying to find ways to make herself vulnerable to employees and I thought that was really cool that she cared that much and I you know you don't see a C CEOs doing that very often um so to really to help you take which um what you've learned today back to your workplace, I'm planning on leaving you with some tools and templates. So I have a smart goals worksheet, a performance coaching discussion planning form. Um, I've got um, a document from the American Psychological Association that I really like on the five components of a psychologically healthy workplace, um, an article with ideas for performance metrics, and then also some information on MRA's Principles of Leadership Excellence series. And Kristen will send these to you after today's session, but um, I'd like to answer, uh, answer any questions that anybody else has now. Or if there's something that I don't have on this list of tools that you would like to see, let me know too. Any, any, anything, anyone? Um, Can you go back one slide? Absolutely, yes.
so as uh, Lisa said, please feel free to take yourself off mute and ask any questions or share yeah. anything. Um, or if it, you're more comfortable, you can still absolutely utilize that chat. Mm -hmm. And and I'll this also is, share my, oh, go ahead. The, this is Vicki. My biggest question is, I know you mentioned OneNote. How yeah. can you provide that quick feedback, document it, and have it available mid-year or throughout the year to look back and say, hey, he's got all these attaboys type things? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think keeping just keeping a journal out, keeping a log. I actually, I that just remind me of something else I can share. And I have this worksheet that it's like a it's a coaching worksheet and it, and there's a place to write the good, the attaboys and a place to write, you know, more coaching covers or more improvement related things. And if you just enter it all into that and then keep it through the year, that's one way. Or if you use OneNote, um, then it's really transparent. And, and, and I used to do this with my manager. Um, we would prepare for the meeting and we, you know, I would go in and update the agenda. That was my job. And I would, you know, that was, I was responsible for preparing what we were going to talk about. And then she would give me feedback and it would be right there. And she'd write it right in the note, in the one note and I'd have it. And, and that's one way of doing it, you know, and just say, this is where all of our, we're going to keep all of our conversations or in our notes, just so we refer, can refer back to them. And um, so, yeah, that, 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 that would take the place of maybe the for formal journaling that you can do in some of the systems that the platforms that they have out now. Or Vicki, what about like blind carbon copying yourself into those emails? And then when you get it, just like drag it into their employee folder and then they're all there whenever That's you need to pull them. Too. Yeah. Or going to your sense and yeah. yeah. There, you know, I think in OneNote too, there's a way, or in I think in Outlook, there's a way to click a little button and have it go to OneNote. I have never done that, but I've mm. seen it up in the menu. So I, I figure that's what that is, but I'm not sure. But that's a great idea, Kristen. Yeah, I like that. That's a great question. Thank you. Hello, this is Valerie. Um, I have a question about if you are, if, if you've been in a pattern of doing annual reviews for many years and you're looking at kind of making a change to doing something that's on a more regular basis, mm -hmm. um, we currently have things set up so that we have our managers meet with their employees on a weekly basis doing one-on-ones anyhow. How do you suggest transitioning from that sort of formal annual review um, to doing something on a more regular basis? Well, they're already doing it, right? their meeting that's kind of how it's kind of how it feels and um, but yeah I, I'm just thinking about sort of how to I want to make sure that employees wouldn't feel like they were kind of missing out on something by no longer having that annual interaction and that formal document yeah. and so on as well well so how do you have a recommendation on how to handle that transition yeah I think you know if it's something that that you feel like your employees want to have a wrap-up you know for the year or even once every six months then the if the manager is keeping that journal and then or you know keeping all feedback that comes at them or all the different sources of information and they download it into that one document then they can put together a summary review at the end of the year or at the six month mark and you know it doesn't have to include everything in detail but it you know gives a good you know a good overview of what the accomplishments were in mm -hmm. um if you're looking for like a template, because um, so, I don't know what your annual review looks like now, but, you know, like a template that I've liked to use in the past has just been, you know, what the accomplishments are, um, what and what I would, you know, what the person wants to learn, what I want to learn. We always did. I always I'm a big fan of self-evaluations, too, mm -hmm. where the employee fills it out and says, these are the things I've accomplished and this is what I want to do in the coming you know, year or six months, here's the development that I think I need. Um, mm -hmm. And then they have this conversation about those things. And um, that can all come th from those notes that they, they take. And it doesn't have to be an exhaustive 10 page note every time they meet, but just mm -hmm. keep the highlights so that they remember. 
Yeah, it actually sounds not that dissimilar to kind of what we're already doing because yeah. um, we yeah. we don't we we don't see obviously from a from an HR perspective we don't see the managers um, weekly notes and that kind of thing but we rely on them to keep them and then that's kind of what they use to build their annual reviews and part of our annual review process is an employee feedback um, thing where the employees can they're in charge of what goes into it. They, it can be one page, it can be 10 pages if they have a lot they want to say that form as part of their record, just to sort of say what those goals are, what's going well, what kind of feedback they have on those around them and their manager and what how their manager can be better help to them. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm just trying to think about how we, I don't want to lose the good things about the annual review in creating mm. something that's more digestible. Um, yeah, yeah. Do you, do you use any performance management software now? Well, we don't at this point. It's a very paper-driven process, and that's part of our pain. Um, obviously, yes, you can do things online. You can PDF sign it and so on. But um, a number of different people who aren't strictly within an employee's um, hierarchy contribute to that review. So that makes it really hard to build it into a system. We have tried a number of different ways to find solutions to that, and without a lot of success, I've got to tell you. Mm -hmm. So Valerie, I'm not sure if this is going to provide any value, but I'm going to, it was just something that came to mind as you were talking. So I have done um, as the employee one-on-ones with my manager every single week. And what mm -hmm. I found those to be was like questions, right? So like, where's this project? Or I have a question about this, or should we do this or that? And that's really what those one-on-ones became. So mm -hmm. if they're already doing those, I mean, I think that's, a great touch point, but maybe it's once a month or once a quarter, the employee and the manager agree that they're going to take 15, 20 minutes and do more of a, um, what did Lori call it? Um, like a performance check-in rather than a review, if that mm -hmm. makes any sense. And then they would have that captured document or feedback that you can remember for the mm -hmm. end of the year makes sense yeah good idea thank you all right well in the interest of time i'm just gonna um close this out thank you guys for coming thank you to lisa for sharing her expertise with us today we will get these uh documents out to you guys so that you can use them but also happy to stay on for a little bit if anyone else has additional questions